straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. The defense continues its case in the Parkland school shooter penalty phase trial. Was there anything in what you saw from the, his behavior that could have foretold this event happening of what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Not in my opinion. And cross-examination gets heated when the defendant grills his ex-wife on the stand. You did hold me down. You did tie me up. You did attack me and you did break into my home when I was sleeping. You raped me. Plus, the death of Emily Noble. Was it suicide or murder? Do you see any plastic deformation in this image? Any of the deformation that I see to that nasal aperture is related to the anti-mortem trauma. And later, after fleeing the country and altering her physical appearance, defense attorneys worry Caitlin Armstrong will not receive a fair trial. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Terry Austin. Jurors in the Parkland School Shooter Penalty Trial hear testimony from a clinical psychologist who treated the gunman when he was a young child. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here to discuss what the psychologist said about Nicholas Cruz. Anjanette? Well, Terry, Dr. Frederick Kravitz is a retired psychologist who actually treated Nicholas Cruz when he was between eight and nine years old. He diagnosed Cruz with ADHD and oppositional defiance disorder. He said he also found features of autism in him. Now, Dr. Kravitz testified that the shooter's adoptive mother, Linda, told him he could be sweet and affectionate, but wasn't really involved in a lot of social activities. He also testified that Cruz's teachers were having difficulties with him and that he was anxious and had obsessive tendencies. But on cross-examination, prosecutor Jeff Marcus asked whether any of that was really relevant to what the shooter did at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School on Valentine's Day in 2018. Was there anything in what you saw from the, his behavior that could have foretold this event happening of what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Not in my opinion. I've worked with some other fairly damaged kids, and certainly, uh, to the best of my knowledge, none of them have ever acted out like this. Now, after Dr. Kravitz testified, a neighbor of the Cruises testified about his recollections of the family. Stephen Schusler described an incident he witnessed between his landlord and Nicholas Cruz when he was 10 years old. And he also described what he saw when uh, he was running with an airsoft gun as a child. She called him weird, and yes, he did not have the boyhood image. You could look at him, and you can see something's not right, something's off. His caricature was, the first thing I saw was him was Alfred E. Newman. It was not a and a tr <laughs> please, and I'm sorry to say this in front of the boy, but he was not attractive. So he had this thing in his hand, and he's running like this. Like that. But he had this gun in his hand, and he's just like that. Oh, oh okay, I think that's... Sufficient. Is there anything else you wanted to demonstrate? No, that's it. All right, so Steven Schusler went on to say that he had met the shooter's mother, Linda Cruz, but conceded he really didn't know what was going on inside the home. Terry? Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Karen Felicia Nance and prosecutor Latonya Hines. Latonya, I'm going to start with you. The defense has called a number of witnesses, including this clinical psychologist, who treated Cruz when he was a child. So people were actually aware of his psychological issues. Do you think this mass shooting could have been prevented based on the fact that so many people knew about this? I mean, this is the question we ask anytime this happens, um, that there are all these different signs. And this is a question of whether or not everybody is talking with each other all at the same time to say, hey, we need to get him treatment. Now, we heard that there was some type of treatment going on with him. Would we have thought that he would have done this to this extent? I don't know. Um, but I think that there were telltale signs that this 
uh, individual definitely was very, very troubled, and maybe there needed to be some more um, treatment or some more inquiry about it. Okay, thank you for that. Karen, we know that the jury has to consider these mitigating circumstances in connection with the defendant's very difficult childhood. But how do you think the families in that audience are reacting to all of this testimony? Well, actually, Terry, when the defense attorney started her opening statement, the camera did pan along the uh, people sitting in the, in the uh, audience, and, and I believe most of them were family members. And they were looking, had uh, some of them had fear in their eyes, others, I think, uh, just unfathomable grief, and others rage. And I think that that's totally understandable. Their emotions are going to be going up and down. In addition, they were spared the the uh, horror, I will call it, of having a, a regular trial for the guilt phase. But now we're in the penalty phase. So all those traumas that they suffered are just being brought back to them now. So I think that that's the saddest part about it, is that they're going to have to sit through this. And they're having a difficult time of it, understandably. I could not agree more. No question about it. It's got to be very difficult sitting in that courtroom. And Jeanette, what else did this neighbor, Stephen Schusler, have to say about what he witnessed during the six years he lived near the cruises? Well, he described uh, the shooter, who was a child then, uh, as somebody who just seemed like he need some, needed some mentoring. He then described how um, he and some other children were hanging out with a guy that he described as having a bit of savoir faire, I guess a, a little bit of swagger, if you will, and that they were smoking cigarettes and things like that. Now, these are all things that kids do as teenagers or, you know, young young kids. Not all, but some do. Um, so he was trying to say that, look, there was just something off with this kid the whole time and something more needed to be done. That was his impression. He wasn't inside the home, as you heard. Thanks, Anjanette, for that additional information. Still ahead on Long Crime Daily, Ohio versus Matthew Moore, the case of an alleged staged suicide that investigators say was actually a murder. But first, defendant Trevor Summers opts to represent himself while standing trial for the kidnapping and attempted murder of his ex-wife. Welcome back. A man charged with the attempted murder of his ex-wife elects to represent himself while his ex-wife testimony is underway. Prosecutors say 45-year-old Trevor Summers kidnapped his wife back in 2017 and attempted to kill her before a witness facilitated an escape. Officials say Summers and Elisa Matheson were in the midst of divorce proceedings when he hacked a murder-suicide plot. They say Summers held his wife captive in her home and the back of her SUV, attempted twice to kill her. On Tuesday, Matheson described the incident during direct examination. My hands are tied behind my back. And at this point, I'm again, this is where he is going to kill me. And they're not That's what you're thinking at this point? And they're not gonna find my body because this is so secluded and such a wooded area. So what happens? So he turned me around and slipped my wrist and said, that's for getting out of the car in the Walgreens. Pushed me back into the car, tied me back to the seat, and buckled me back in with my hands still tied behind my back. On Wednesday, Summers once again elected to represent himself, arguing he should move forward with cross-examination. Mr. Summers, you have a request of the court, sir? Yes, Your Honor. I what would, is it? I would like to... Um, resume self-representation and discharge Mr. Marchese as lead counsel. And you believe that to be a wise decision? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Are you unhappy with the services of Mr. Marchese? Uh, I'm not unhappy with the services of Mr. Marchese. I do not believe that he fully understands um, the circumstances surrounding the events, and it would be better if I did the cross-examination um, from here on out. After that, Summers moved forward with the cross-examination of the witness, his ex-wife. Testimony got heated when Summers asked about a sexual encounter. Did I threaten you to have sex? 
you broke into my home in the middle of the night when I was sleeping, attacked me and tied me up. I take that as, yes, you threatened me to have sex with you. Yes. I'm asking you specifically, before we had sex, did I threaten you or force you to have sex with me? My answer is yes, you forced me to have sex with you. Did I hold you down? No. Did I push you? Not at that time of having sex, but prior to having sex, you did push me, you did hold me down, you did tie me up, you did attack me, and you did break into my home when I was sleeping. You raped me. Wow, Karen, let me start with you. The defendant has vacillated more than once on this issue of self-representation. Now that he's representing himself, how do you think this is affecting the victim's testimony? I mean, right there, she seemed very upset. I agree t totally, Terry. I think that this was a plan all along. I think that he had plenty of time to come up with this idea of having his attorney do the, the legwork to get to this point, and then he switched up because he wanted this opportunity to cross-examine his ex-wife. What was the purpose? To intimidate her, to discredit her, and ultimately get her to come off of her statement with the hope that she would totally fall apart and hopefully he, by the skin of his teeth, would be able to convince the jury that he shouldn't be convicted. But I think more so this was an opportunity for him to show up for TV, to show uh, what he could do and, and have his life story immortalized, immortalized. And I think that that's what this is about. Well, good for her for standing up to him. Actually, he's not doing a bad job as an attorney. Listen, Latonya, the defendant has indicated that he wants to serve a subpoena to call Elise back for his direct case to raise additional issues that were not covered during direct. Where do you think he's going with this? I mean, I think it's continued vic victimization of the victim. I mean, how many, oper how many times does this happen? where a victim, especially in a case like this, is having to confront the person who is alleged to have caused the issue, right? She's, a, she's having to confront and talk to and answer questions to the person who's accused of trying to kill her. Um, I think that is just continued victimization. And I think it's the fact that he is a bit of a narcissist. It's a narcissistic way of keeping control. It's Absolutely. his way of controlling her. Couldn't agree more, no doubt about it. Listen, coming up on Long Crime Daily, the woman accused of murdering a professional cyclist appears for a hearing in Texas. Plus, the state rests its case and calls its final witnesses in the Ohio case of Matthew Moore as he faces charges in the 2020 staged suicide death of his wife. Welcome back. The state rests its case in the Ohio trial of Matthew Moore as he faces murder charges in the death of his wife, Emily Noble. Moore reported Noble missing after her 52nd birthday in May 2020. Hundreds of volunteers conducted search parties to look for her over the next few months, though Moore reportedly never took part. In mid-September, a group of women found Noble's body in a wooded area near the couple's home with a USB cord tied to a tree branch and wrapped around her neck. Her body was so badly decomposed, investigators had to use dental records and DNA to confirm her identity. Officials say her death was staged to look like a suicide, but they believed evidence pointed to murder. The following June, Moore was arrested and charged with felony murder and felonious assault. A state witness testified that damage to the victim's skull suggested there was injury to her face after her death. On Wednesday, the defense's first witness, a forensic anthropologist, disagreed. She testified Noble's injuries are consistent with a suicide, saying her findings indicate most of the damage to her face happened long before she died. Tell the jurors about plastic deformation or deformation. So plastic deformation a lot of times is an indicator uh, for perimortem blunt force trauma. Essentially, when you have a load applied to the bone, right, the bone has elastic, a little bit of elastic properties to it. And if you were to stop applying that force, it would just go back to the way that it was. If you were then to continue applying force, that's when you get failure for that fracture. Any of the deformation that I see to that nasal aperture is related to the antemortem trauma. 
Did you notice through the course of your review that there was post-mortem damage? Uh, in this case, the lacrimals are damaged. Usually, we're not going to have a big hole there. Where is post-mortem damage? How does it happen? There's lots of ways. Um, when remains are exposed to the elements, um, there's animal scavenging, birds, rodents, um, anything that is like post-depositional. Latonia, the forensic anthropologist, testified that damage to Noble's face was not recent and that it happened long before she died. Why do you think that's important for this jury to hear? Because they're trying to show that there is this idea that he didn't do this after she died to try to, you know, hide her real cause of death. Here's the reality. The defense has to do one thing. They just need to convince one person that what they're saying is true, or better yet, make one person doubt the state's case. All they need to do, and so they've got an expert witness, and they're trying to use that expert witness to bring doubt as to when she actually died and who actually is at fault, whether or not she did it herself and whether or not he did it. And their thing is, she did, he didn't do it. This was something either self-inflicted that happened with her, but they put doubt in the minds of the jurors, at least one juror, that's all they need. You know, you raise a very good point there. The burden is on the prosecution, not the defense. But Karen, this defense counsel is very proactive. She's actually putting witnesses on the stand. How do you think she's doing so far? I think she's doing an effective job. Uh, she most recently on, on our, our show, Law and Crime, had been uh, representing uh, William Husel, Dr. Will William Husel, with uh, Jose Baez. And so he was acquitted of 14 counts of murder. I think that she's effective. She's very deliberate in her questioning of the uh, witnesses. And also she... Uh, is masterful and will be successful because she is very compelling and I, I love watching her. She does an awesome job. Thanks for that reminder. I had forgotten about that. She's an excellent attorney. Listen, when we come back, Caitlin Armstrong is back in court. What motion did the prosecution and defense agree on in the case? Welcome back. The woman accused of murdering a professional cyclist, fleeing the country and altering her appearance to evade law enforcement, appears for a hearing in Texas. Back in June, 34-year-old Caitlin Armstrong was arrested for her involvement in the shooting death of Mo Wilson. Wilson, whose real name is Anna Mariah, was shot and killed more than 40 days earlier. Investigators say she may have dated Armstrong's boyfriend while the two were broken up. After Wilson's death, officials say Armstrong used someone else's passport to flee to Costa Rica, where she dyed her hair and underwent cosmetic surgery. Armstrong was later arrested and brought back to the United States. While she appeared in court via Zoom on Wednesday, the judge ruled the hearing could not be recorded. After a flurry of motions from both sides, the judge agreed to prohibit discussions with the media as proceedings continue. This case comes as defense attorneys voice concern for an unbiased trial based on widespread media coverage. Latonia, I'll start with you this time. Listen, the prosecution filed a motion for a gag order. Then the defense filed a motion to prohibit prejudicial comments to the media. At the end of the day, the judge prohibited all discussions with the media. Was this the right decision in this case? Look, I've been a part of some pretty high profile cases and I think it is the, the right decision because here's ultimately what they both have to make sure of, the defense and the prosecution. You wanna make sure that you're able to see an impartial jury. And when you have a case like this, which everybody can know about with social media, you know about it, you, it's hard to find jurors who have not heard something. And then if you're out there giving media statements, then they're having that opportunity to hear that prior to you actually getting a chance to do voir dire. So I think it was a very good idea to do that in this case. Well, it makes sense. You're not supposed to try your case in the media. Both sides should basically leave their arguments for the courtroom. But Karen, this is not a Johnny Depp Amber Heard case. I mean, it's a big case, but doesn't the public have a right to know about it, even if it is a big case? Yes, the public does have a right to know. Constitutionally, we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of the press. And I agree with LaToya that 
that information that's already out there in social media, it's going to be there. The judge doesn't have any control over the media, but the judge does have control over the information that the attorneys, both the defense and prosecution, are going to put out about the case. So the judge can limit what the attorneys are, are sharing with the public regarding the information in that courtroom. It's the judge's courtroom, and the judge can make the determination as to what information should or should not be distributed to the public. On the other hand, it makes a lot of sense if both of the parties, the defense and the prosecution, can have a mutual agreement on what they're willing to share or, or what should be shared to, with the public and what shouldn't be. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that judge has to make sure that it's a tight hold on both parties so that they don't prejudice the case in one form or another. And it looks like this case is going to be delayed in any case. So hopefully it's not going to have an effect on the outcome. Do you agree, Karen? Yes, I, I agree. And usually when, with the defense's position as a defense attorney, it's helpful to delay it as long as possible. Thank you both for joining us today here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.